Hello and welcome to another Creative Futures q and I'm Graham Park and joining me for this session is a writer, a broadcaster, consultant and blogger who, according to his website, can show you the future. Please welcome Tom Cheeswright. Thank you very much. So Tom, um, according to your website and your book, which we'll talk about later, you're a futurist. Mm. What is a futurist? So I work with mostly large companies and bits of government and sometimes charities uh, to really answer three questions. First of all, what does our future look like? And sometimes people are interested in the future and the big picture and the long term. So what might happen in 20, 25, 30 years? And I work on that, but a lot more of my work is on the next five years. And when I say, you know, what does our future look like, it's very specifically that company's future. They want to know what's going to take them out at the knees in the next five years. One of the big shocks coming that they've not seen yet. And they've seen a lot of their competitors or their peers being tripped up by. So I do a lot of work around foresight and how you look at the future. And the second thing I have to do then is, is take that foresight, take the things we've seen and turn it into a story. Because there's no point having these ideas unless you can convince people to act on them. So sometimes that's taking that story out to people's customers. We do a lot of storytelling through the media and through sort of press campaigns and actually direct communication about what the future looks like for that industry or for those customers, but actually for staff and sometimes shareholders as well. You know, sometimes my job is going back to the board and saying, this is what we've seen working with your executives. You need to make some changes to um, arrest decline or innovate or come up with something new. And then the third challenge, the, the third question that naturally drops out of that is, well, we've seen the future. You've convinced us that this is going to happen. What on earth do we do about it? And so I get involved in innovation and change programs and fundamentally changing organisations to make them more adaptive to the change that we've seen coming. Well, that's a real, that, I think I know what a futurist is. That. <laughs> um, but when did you realise you're a futurist? Because I'm assuming at primary school you didn't say when asked... What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a futurist. When, when, do you, when did you first of all realise that you were a futurist and that you wanted to make a career out of it? Well, I mean, you say that I didn't know at primary school. So, uh, 1980, 81, when I was uh, living in London, my mum bought me at a book fair at the end of our road, the Usborne Book of the Future. <coughs> and the what book of the future? The Usborne Book of the Future. Okay. And I've still got my copy now. It's very tattered and it's falling apart. But it was the first thing that I saw that, that showed me that beyond the realms of science fiction, beyond you know, writing the next Star Wars or something like that, there were actually people thinking about seriously what the future might look like. How old were you in 1981? Three. Two, two or three. Really? Yeah, I was an early reader. Um, wow. And I convinced her to buy me this book because it had spaceships on the front and robots. And because, so so now, now I know why. Your Twitter handle is book of, at exactly. book of the future. Okay. So, so, so you know, fast forward 2006, I started a blog called Book of the Future. You know, this book was now something distant in the past. I actually wrote to Usborne and said, "Are you producing a new one?" They said, "No." I said, "Right, well, I'll do it." And I wrote, started writing a blog called Book of the Future. And my idea was that I'll write about technology and society and everything that's coming. Uh, and around the same time, uh, probably not long after I, or around the time I met you. I started doing stuff for the BBC as well uh, and, and broadcasting about the future and technology and doing gadget reviews and all sorts of stuff. But really, I didn't become an actual futurist until 2012. Um, so I was uh, working, I, I was doing a tech startup and we'd raised about half a million in venture capital. Um, we had a business. And um, I, you know, as with all startups, and you may learn this at some point if you haven't already, they consume an enormous amount of your mm. life. Uh, and I was working about 70 hours a week. Uh, I had two young kids who I had no relationship with, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I was pretty miserable. Uh, and actually, my investors were pretty miserable as well because they didn't think I could do the job. So I took what I call an assisted jump out of my business. Um, I jumped into being a full-time futurist, turning the blog into a business, but with the hand of the investors firmly in my back. Um, so, yeah, and that, that's when it became a real thing. That must have been quite... Uh challenge though because if you've got your own business with people funding it mm. and, you just and a salary s and a salary <laughs> yeah so um yeah it just sounds a bit more yeah, i mean it wasn't the first that. time it wasn't the first time so i started my own business the first time in 2005 um i was really lucky i, I decided i wanted to leave i was living in the southeast uh, me and my wife my now wife we weren't married then wanted to move in together and we wanted to get out of the southeast <coughs> as well 
we settled on Manchester. We decided to move before we worked out what on earth we were going to do. Mm -hmm. And actually my employer then said, well, don't leave. Go freelance and do some days for us and we'll leave you 10 days a month or eight days a month to go and do your own thing. Mm -hmm. So I started starting businesses with a bit of a safety cushion underneath me. Mm -hmm. But I started sort of three or four between then and now. And, you know, so I'm, I'm quite used to making that leap into the unknown by 2012. It wasn't, it was scary, sure, but it wasn't as scary. It might have been 10 years earlier when I'd never actually started my own thing. Um, so I sold a few shares back to the business. It gave me a little bit of a cushion and that was it. So sticking with the term futurist for a minute though, um, what's the origin of the word futurist? I mean, I mean when was futurist seen as an occupation or, or like a, a so, vocation? I'm mean, I mean, guessing your futurologist is what a lot of people call themselves or, um, uh, originally, and that probably goes back to the sort of 1960s, sort of post-Cold War, or maybe even slightly before that at the Rand Corporation, where this whole idea of scenario planning came about, this idea that you could tell stories about the future to get people to think differently about it and start to recognise that they may be facing dramatic change at some point. So as a profession, as a career, it probably goes into that sort of Cold War, back to that sort of Cold War era. Um, although, you know, arguably, you can go back to much earlier than that. Uh, there's someone I mentioned reference in the book, you know, Herman van Moltke, who was a sort of, you know, general in the Prussian army, who was sort of doing the right sort of strategic thinking that you could almost call a futurist. Um, but I, I call myself a, a futurist as distinct from a futurologist. Just, it's, really, it's just shorter and snappier. But also, mm. I, I, I'm a bit pedantic about futurology. You know, an ology is, is a study of something. And I don't think it really is a study. I, you know, I try and put some methodology and some science behind it. And I've built my own kind of tools. I now teach to people about how you look at the future. But you can't really study it. What you're really doing is trying to get people to think differently. And so I always struggle a bit with that futurology bit, as if somehow you're the one with this clear vision of the future, you're the only one who sees it, and you're studying it and bringing back what you see, when actually it's about a, a business methodology for how you think about things. So apart from reading Book of the Future when you were a toddler, <laughs> um, what qualifies you as a futurist? Because your um, academic background or your educational background is in engineering. Yeah. So what qualifies you? Because from what <coughs> you've said, I mean, I, I kind of know you through creative industry and creative media contact yeah. context. But from what you said, you work with all different types of corporations and yeah. business. What qualifies you as a futurist? And can you be apply your futurist outlook and knowledge to anything? So the answer to that one is yes. So the, the toolkit I've built is absolutely what you'd say it's, we'd call horizontal. So I've worked in everything from you know future of cars with you know, Audi and BMW to the future of retail with the people who make you know, Vitties and people like that, to you know, Kellogg's, to you know property, to or super yachts, you know all sorts of stuff. And it's the same toolkit that applies. What qualifies me? And you can do a degree in future studies, but, but there's really two classes of futurist. You get the academic future who tend to end up working in government or in big corporations like Shell, who apply very you know, well-studied, um, robust methodologies like scenario planning and causal aid analysis to do these great long analyses of what might happen in 30 years. And then you get your sort of pontificators. You get your ex-CEOs, ex-chief marketing officers, generally men, uh, who've you know been in senior roles, enjoyed the talking to the press and the dancing on you know, on the, you know doing the jazz hands on stage and, and sharing their <laughs> opinions very loudly, uh, and like to continue it and so call themselves a futurist as a vehicle to do that to go and speak at conferences. Uh, and I sit somewhere between the two. I mean, I'd be I'd be lying if I said I don't really enjoy the jazz hands bit of it. I like performing. I like being on stage. I like being opinionated. Um, but I've tried to put a bit more methodology behind that as well, a bit of science mm -hmm. behind it. And, that, and that's really where the engineering background comes in. You know, I come at this not as a, you know, someone with marketing experience. You know, I used to run a marketing agency. But I come at this really with a sort of an engineering mindset and sort of systems mindset and trying to understand things. And I think perhaps my best qualification is being an entrepreneur. So, you know, three or four times over from sort of 2005 to 2012 when I went full time as a futurist, I put my own money on the line to say, I think yeah. this is going to happen. And, 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 you know, none of them have been Facebook, but they've all been in the right, you know, but that's more my failed execution than my failed vision. You know, back in 2006, I launched a content-driven marketing company. We were number one on Google for content-driven marketing. You try and secure the first position on Google now for content-driven marketing, and it will cost you millions of pounds a year because everyone's doing it. But back in 2006, people weren't. I also, at the same year, tried to launch what, what would have been a competitor to Deliveroo, um, but the, the, we were all focused on other things at the time. All right. 
And then 2009 launched this analytics business. You know, we, we launched a, a, a personal analytics business that, uh, that understands who people are on a website. And again, you know, it's, we never achieved that sort of rocket ship status, but we built a, a profitable technology business out of that idea, which we had in 2009 and you know, has proven to be really attractive to people. So um, obviously, uh, as a futurist, do you have competitors? Do you, are there other futurists who have a similar profile to you? And, and if there are, you're nodding so there are, how do you keep one step ahead of them? Because you're, you're often on B, the BBC Breakfast, BBC Radio, national and local, and you're always popping up on my <laughs> social media feed um, on different platforms. How do you keep ahead of the competition? It, it's really interesting because the, the, the profession, if you can call it that, is growing. And, you know, the, the number of times I see people on LinkedIn now who are, whose job title is now includes futurists, and there are more and more of us. You know, and I have, I have an advantage in that I already had a media presence beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, so it came out of one of my previous startups. I started a business called Eggheads in 2006. Again, the idea was we, we hope to choose, buy, and use modern technology. Uh, and my wife was working with you then at a radio station, and so a lot of my first clients were all DJs. So I was mm -hmm. going around to be like Justin Morehouse's house and setting up his home cinema system for him and things. And these, you know, one of these DJs said, oh, you're quite good at explaining this stuff. Do you want to come on my show and answer people's tech questions? I'm like, sure, why not? Uh, and that sort of expanded into doing BBC Breakfast and uh, John Richardson's show last summer and all sorts of things, um, which is great fun. So it gave me a bit of a media presence, which, was, which has been really valuable. And also a background in marketing. So I used to run a digital marketing agency. We used to do stuff for Manchester United and Iceland Foods and Graham Park. And... Um, <laughs> And, and, and you know, that experience of the, sort of the process and the discipline of marketing and building a brand has been really valuable as well. And I still invest a huge amount of time and money actually in PR and social media. Uh, and still uh, the second biggest source of traffic to my website is, mm. is uh, Twitter. Really? Um, Twitter drives you know, the second, and, and all my leads come through my website pretty much. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's something that I, I, I learned from you. Uh, it's, so you shouldn't just rely on social media you need to connect everything together, don't you? It's very hard for people to convert from social media. It's very hard for people to go from a sort of 280 characters to, yes, I want to buy from that person. But if you can shift them down that funnel slowly from, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I'd like to read a little bit more about that. Actually, I understand what they could do for me. Here's a really easy way for me to buy it. And it's, it's, it's not a, it's, it's an art form as much as a profession. There's lots mm. of data that you can use to try and drive that, understand that process and drive people down it. But you know, through trial and error, actually through a lot of external support. You know, one of the things I had to come to terms with a few years ago was that you know, I've been a professional futurist for five years. I hadn't been a marketer for a long time. You know, that five years is a long time in marketing. And so actually you know, a few years ago, I went, do you know what, I need expert support. I have to go and ask some people to give me their independent perspective on this. And that had a massive impact a couple of years ago on changing what I did, where the business focused, and actually driving up the presence of the website and driving more leads through that. Well, it was in 2010 that you said to me, you're very prolific on Facebook and Twitter, <laughs> which is pre-Instagram. You have you thought about your websites? Who bothers about that anymore? But you were right, and I'm glad I did, because now this is grahampart.com. Oh, dear, I've managed to get a plug in. Um, <laughs> um, everything gets directed to there, and I get a lot of work um, yeah. through that. Um, which, I mean, a lot of the students who, who watch this... Um, more than likely will be freelancers and self-employed. Now you obviously have got many years experience of being a freelancer and self-employed. Um, what advice would you give them? And, and obviously I'm, what, what would be the best social media platforms for I mean, that? Well, I think you have to be on all of them increasingly, maybe not all, um, but for me, you know, where, my, where my customers sit is LinkedIn, um, is Twitter, to some extent, Instagram, particularly for the events industry, and a lot of my work now is, is conference speaking. So conference producers are very visual quite often. They're really interested in video clips and, and photos. They like to know where you are, who you're speaking to, and Instagram's useful for that. Uh, YouTube has been, and Vimeo actually, I use both of them for different things. YouTube is sort of regular updates. Is it about tailoring content for the platform? Yeah. So don't just do one yeah, post. I've fallen into that trap many times because yeah. you, know, you get lazy after a while and you start to blast stuff out across everything. But you find increasingly that the, the uh, you get the greatest impact when you tailor it to different platforms. And so you know, LinkedIn's a great one. You know, LinkedIn gets dismissed as being sort of boring and corporate. And it is full of far too many people oh, sharing... God like really cheesy motivational stuff. But 
you know, lots of business people hang out there. And if you were exactly. going to sell to that audience, that is where you find them. And they, they you know, someone pointed out to me yesterday, well, again, one of the, my sort of trusted advisors pointed out to me yesterday, she said, she's, well, she said she's noticed that the LinkedIn algorithm really doesn't like links. So if you just post the same sort of story you would on Twitter, which is, you know, a bit of text and a link underneath it on LinkedIn, it gives very little traction. Right. Whereas actually, if you do a pricey of that story with a lot more text on LinkedIn and actually talk about it, you get a lot more traction. It's like, you've really got to understand the difference between the social networks and how they behave, how their users behave and how their algorithms behave as well. So tailoring content. Yeah, platform. totally. Do you ever employ anyone to do any of your uh, social media? Yeah, absolutely. So, and I actually had for, um, so when, when I started this business, I didn't really know what it was going to be. I thought it was going to be an, a consultancy, a bit like my agency, perhaps. I thought mm -hmm. it might be a sort of publishing business. You know, I wasn't entirely sure how to grow it. And so initially, I actually employed a load of apprentices. I had this idea that I wanted uh, my bosses to be younger than me, and they just sort of run the business and then point me in the right direction to do all the, frankly, the fun stuff, the bits I enjoyed mm -hmm. doing. I didn't want to fall into the trap I'd done pre in previous businesses where you start a business doing something you really enjoy, and then within two years, you find that all you're doing is HR and finance. You know, you're just managing people yeah. and money and never doing the fun stuff. And so I thought, right now, I'm going, to, I'm going to actually get apprentices to be my boss this time. And one of them I employed to do social media. And he actually did my social media for five, six years, right up to Christmas. He joined me when he was 17. Uh, trained him up within about three weeks. He just got it. He understood my brand really well, understood what interested me and my audience. And he did... Um, sort of you know 12 posts uh, um, no, about 20 posts a week for me every week for about six years uh, and he's actually just gone off he's gone off freelance now um, and he's doing his own thing that's good um, so with a bit of guidance you can leave him to yeah. do yeah and you trust and, and the only reason the only reason i stopped employing people is because the business was going too well that whole idea that i would be the one going out and seeing all the customers worked really well and in large part down to him he grew my social media following from sort of you know 1200 people to 15,000. Uh, on Twitter um, through what he was doing and, and the result was I was spending loads of time out either in London or out of the country speaking of things uh, and you know, the result was I couldn't support him anymore so originally he went to an agency and I paid the agency for his time and then now he's gone off freelance and he's, uh, he's got his, another job as well. So Let me just test you as a futurist. Go on. <laughs> or get your thoughts. Um, what the, the department I teach in here at Glendale University is creative media technology uh, and that's a lot of music and media. Now that's an industry that's ch music particularly has changed dramatically in the past 20 years. Yeah. From physical product to streaming with downloads in between. Um, what's the future for music and media? It, it's always been a space that fascinated me because I actually, uh, I ran the press. My first job was in marketing, so I did a degree in mechatronic engineering, then went into marketing. What, what's mechatronic? Uh, mechanical, electronic, computing, and management. All right, back to music um, and media, please. And one of my first clients was a company called Real Networks, so who you never hear about anymore, but they basically invented streaming media. So every time you watch a video or listen to a piece of music digitally, they invented that technology fundamentally. Right. And so when, the, when Napster came along and started allowing everybody to download music illegally for free, Eventually, after a few years, the music industry said, right, we've got to have a legal alternative to this. We're going to start selling MP3s. The company they turned to was Real Networks. And so when it came to launch legal music downloading for the first time anywhere in the world, they came to us and said, right, we want to launch this to the world's media. Here's five major music labels and this, tech, this American technology company. We're going to launch this in London. You're in charge. Wow. Um, so we, yeah, we, we, we ran this press conference. We brought the world's world of media there and launched legal music downloading. So ever since I've watched this industry really carefully. And it's, I mean, you're right. The, 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 the level to which it's changed. I, I had a, one of those... Uh, moments that really illustrated this. So the point at which HMV went under. Yes. Yeah, HMV was employing three to three and a half thousand people across something like you know, 2,000 stores to turn over about a billion pounds in I think it was 2009. And the same year I got to, I was reviewing gadgets, got invited in by Apple to their offices in Regent Street or just off Regent Street and got given the tour before I got given my iPhone to try. And, uh, and the guy said, you know, and he's giving me a little tour. He says, oh, yeah, that's the Mac team and that's the uh, social media team. That's the iTunes team. I said, how many people is that? He said, 17. So you've got three and a half thousand people <coughs> shifting a billion. Yeah. And by my sort of back of, you know, napkin maths, 17 people shifting 1.7 billion. 
Wow. You know, in the same year. Like, it was so transparent what was going to happen to music at that point. And, and, you know, and the big thing that's happened since then, I think, has been, and it's probably the biggest trend that defines it for the future, is this explosion of choice. You know, we've taken the friction out of music production, media production. We've taken the friction out of reach to get, actually getting to people. And the result is we just have more choice. Mm -hmm. Now, the average quality is undoubtedly lower. You know, there's lots of dross to wade through, whether it's on TikTok or YouTube or, frankly, Netflix, which is terrible at describing its own product. Um, but the volume goes up and the diversity of what's out there that goes up, which means you're much more likely to find something that really fits your needs. And so you know, what's the future of this? This is, I think, probably something to do with, with intermediaries. It's the middlemen and women, the ones who help us choose and navigate the incredible variety of stuff that's out there. It's why you know, I do a lot of radio, as you say, and you know, DJs always ask me, like, are we going to be able to be replaced by robots? I'm like, no, because you know, an AI can only go so far in helping you navigate the incredible variety of content that's out there. Increasingly, what we're turning to is taste makers and trusted intermediaries, and I think that's a really interesting role in the future of media. Yeah, so the kind of the, the equivalent of when I used to go to a record shop every week to physically buy records, the person behind the counter would give me a pile, but then the, the people behind the, the people, the customers, would suggest things as well. Mm. So, you, so there's still a place for that. Absolutely. And Thank I think, goodness. You, know, if you only have to look at Amazon's recommendations to know how oh, far we are from useless. AI doing a really good job recommending stuff to you. And, and I'm not saying it's not going to come. And I think you know, within 10 years, most of us will have a personal AI that does a lot of recommendation for us. So, so that would kind of bring on to like the wider creative industries in general. Mm. So, that, so, so linking uh, the future of music and media and what you've just said would link in beautifully to the creative industries. There's always going to be um, a role um, for, for my students. You look at what's going the away. The content. Yeah. But look at what's going away in the world of work. You know, so people often talk about you know robots taking jobs. Robots don't take jobs. Robots take take work. They can only do specific tasks, and, and any single job is always a collection of tasks. Some of those tasks, usually the most boring ones, are going to robots in the next few years. What's left? What do we really value from human beings in the workplace increasingly? It's the ability to discover and qualify information and new things. It's the ability to create new stuff. And it's the ability to communicate those ideas to people. And I think you know, having those those jobs in that in, in the sort of the, the the almost the the productization of creativity. You know, I think it only gets more valuable in the next few years. The the ability to create is going to be much more widely held. You know, for example, you know, most people in the tech industry think we're going to shift from phones to smart glasses sometimes in the next ten years. Everyone's walking around with ultra high def cameras and you know, and you know high quality microphones you know every single concert is going to be captured from 93 million different perspectives but how do you take that and turn it into a story how do yeah. you create that how do you turn it into something professional how do you produce something that is a cut above in terms of quality so you're saying that artificial intelligence at the moment can't do that mm. will it be able to do that in 20 years time? it will be able to do some of it right yeah. and but i think you know there's this sort of 80 20 rule springing up and, and music's a great example of this you know, when, when we shifted to streaming, you know, most people have gone down the streaming route for most of their music consumption. But at the same time as music consumption became increasingly sort of ephemeral and just you know, a bit sort of background because it's always just sort of there, we started spending more on vinyl. We mm -hmm. started spending more on live music. And we started really craving and chasing these much more visceral human experiences where we're really present in what we're doing. And I think the same thing happens to all media consumption in the next few years. 80% of it might be AI chosen, just something that sort of fits the bill at the time. But we're going to take real pleasure in that 20% time of choosing something that's very human, very high quality. But as a futurist, could, did you predict or could you see this rise in vinyl? Oh, the, the rise in vinyl, no. I mean, that's something I've actually learned from that to predict other stuff around, right, right. you know, things that's happening in, yeah. in food and drink, etc. But we absolutely did predict, funny enough, we did predict uh, Spotify and all that, you know, a decade before it appeared, pretty much. Um, we, we used to talk about this thing we called the Celestial Jukebox. 
-hmm. And it was this idea, you know, as soon as they told me about you know, stream, you know, streaming music and downloads and all this stuff, it's like, well, why could you not have 30 million tunes in the sky somewhere? And this was in the early days of like two and a half G, yeah. where you know, we, I was already sort of streaming photos to my phone. Mm -hmm. you know, I was like, why could you not have 30 million you know, songs up there just streamed to your phone wherever you are? And sure enough, you know, 10 years later, we could get it. I, I remember in the early 80s when I used to we started making music, the guy in the studio said, one day, when I turn up to the studio on my record, he said, one day, <laughs> you'll have all your music on something the size of a credit card. That was 1984, I laughed, and of course. I, I remember being, my first MP3 player was um, a plug-in accessory for my Ericsson T39 World wow. phone. Wow. And I was, on a, I was on a train into London, and I had my headphones in, plugged in, and this woman was like, are you listening to music? I was like, yeah. She's like, where's it coming from? And I, and I showed her an SD card. It was the first wow. time she It was a 32 megabyte SD card. Wow. It had like four songs on it. <laughs> wow. But it was the first time she'd ever seen an SD card. Um, you mentioned food. Tell us about Future Pizza. Oh, so this is one of those people, something, yeah, I get these really weird phone calls sometimes. And it's like, uh, you know, what do you know about the future of food? I said, well, I've done this, this, and this project for Kellogg's and people. And they said, you know, would you be interested in working on a project on the future of pizza? I was like, sure, why not? And it was for, um, there's a thing called the Big, Bang, the Big Bang Fair at the NEC in Birmingham every year, and it's a, it's a science, technology, engineering fair for kids. Uh, and it's designed to get them excited. And so for the launch campaign for that, they wanted to talk about what the future of pizza looks like, because all kids love pizza. And so we, we did this project, we said, well, okay, what are the big issues that they're going to have to face in the future around climate change and you know, urbanisation and globalisation and all these things? How can we change the ingredients of a pizza to A, start to address some of those issues and B, engage kids in this idea that all, such, all sorts of disciplines of science and engineering are involved in food production, things that are really important to them? So we changed, we swapped out 20% of the base of the pizza from flour to ground up insects, to crickets. Um, increases the protein count, drops your carbohydrates, but actually potentially much greener as well. And there's a big issue with wheat production. So one of the things people don't know is that some of the uh, weather changes driven by climate change might actually wipe out large swathes where we grow wheat um, in Europe, which could make wheat really expensive. So swapping out could be really appealing. And um, we changed the tomatoes for ones grown in vertical farms. And if you've seen these, where you these yeah. warehouses with giant you know, trays that stack up all automated, uh, and we changed the cheese out for a vegan cheese, which was surprisingly nice actually. No, Ma yeah, it was. It's the only vegan cheese I've tried that okay. was actually edible. Um, an almond ba almond milk based vegan cheese. Really? And uh, yeah, and then we tried it on unsuspecting punters. And, and uh, they, they were all right, actually. We, we started off with some school kids and they, they were quite all right about it. Uh, we then went to a place called Crazy Pedro's in Manchester with I a German yeah. TV show yeah. and, uh, and got them to try it the other day, which was good fun. But yeah, I mean, the, the campaign's just gone international. It's been in the Times of India, the New York Post. I've had abuse from right-wing American columnists <laughs> about, um, about, I clearly don't know what I'm talking well, about. Well, that's what they're there for. Well, absolutely. To abuse everyone. And, uh, and yeah, and then, and, then, uh, the week, and then last week, I was on, um, so this German film crew rocks up in Manchester to come and see me. We had to recreate this pizza at Crazy Pedro's. And I was on this thing called Galileo, which is, it's kind of like a, this a target reference, kind of like a cross between The One Show and Tomorrow's World. It's right. like, a, it's a daily science show with millions of viewers in, in Germany. And we were like wow. the closing segments, like the closing 10 minutes of that show uh, was, was me showing them this future pizza. <laughs> A um, couple more questions before we see if there's any questions from the audience. It would be amiss of me not to ask you the following question because we're at a university. Um, the future of higher education and academia, what's your brief thoughts on that? Yeah, the, the nature of jobs is changing and they change much more rapidly. And so the idea that you can complete your education at the age of 21 or 23 or 24 and then go into the world of work and never return is just gone. I mean, that idea is gone. And, you know, so absolutely we're going to be retraining throughout our lives. Now, some of that retraining is going to be digital, it's going to be self-serve, it's going to be web-based. But actually, we haven't built anything yet that has the equivalent bandwidth of communication as two people sat opposite each other. Right. You know, there's a good reason we're doing this face-to-face. -face. It's why people are in the audience rather than just watching the video necessarily. It's because there's something about being in the room that adds something that we haven't replicated digitally yet. And so I think actually university is a place where people come together to learn, to share ideas, still have a strong place. What I think I struggle to see the future for, for certainly for the proportion of the population who does it now, is the undergraduate degree. You know, it's a great opportunity to go and 
you know, meet new people, work out who you are, spend a few more years doing that. But I think from an from a economic and a job perspective, it's going to be increasingly hard to justify in the future. I think we're good now. I think in the long term, that's going to be hard to justify. And so I think what we end up doing is doing a lot more time at university, but increasingly spread out over the course of our lives rather than that big, intensive chunk at the start. Well, you need to talk to our vice chancellor then, don't you? Happy to so have a conversation. So we can be one step ahead. <laughs> uh, OK, before we open, the, open up for questions, tell us quickly about High Frequency Change, your uh, book, which I've read on holiday last year. Fantastic. Um, how did that come about? So it's an answer to the question that I had for myself, which was, why on earth are these massive companies calling me? Um, so, I mean, the thing I'm both continuously surprised about, but, but proudest about with this business is, is who I work with. And I work with, you know, 30, 30, 35 of the Global 500, you know, governments, all sorts of people. And, and that started really early. You know, I threw up this website saying, I'm a futurist. And in the first six weeks, LG, Nikon and Sony pictures rang up. I was like, right, something's going on here. Why are these huge companies ringing up this chap in Manchester and saying, we need your help? Uh, and so I started trying to answer that question. And my first answer was, well, it's about the speed of change. Yeah, everyone's telling me change is happening faster now. And Ray Kurzweil, chief futurist at Google, writes three inch thick books about arguing that change happens faster now. And I bought into that and for two years I was going around saying, change happens fast now, this is why you need a futurist, you've got to look further ahead because things are coming at you quicker. Which was great until I sat down with a historian friend who told me it was absolute, and I usually use a ruder word than this, nonsense. <laughs> um, and that, that people have always felt that, that, that whatever period of time they were in in the past, that change happened faster. And there's no really good empirical argument that change happens fast now. And even if there was, would we be able to see it from where we are? So let's get back to the drawing board. And, and, and yeah, he pointed out things like we still bathe in baths, live in houses, you know, sleep in beds that look exactly like they did 100 years ago. You know, if things are really happening faster now, why are those things not changing as well? And what I, the conclusion I came to is that change is kind of happening at two speeds. You've got this low frequency change, which tends to be the, the big societal cross industry changes that touch everything. And I use the washing machine as an example of that in the book. You know, the washing machine, you know, uh, you pull women out of domestic labour from 63 hours a week down to an average of 14 hours a week domestic labour now. Um, it, you know, created the leisure industry, created so much more free time. Um, it, you know, changed the shape of the workforce. It changed the shape of our working lives and our home lives. It's hugely dramatic change, but it took decades to reach a significant portion of the population and have all those effects, and I think has still got some way to go. Compare that to something like the hoverboard, which you know, appeared in 2015 under the feet of Justin Bieber. Everybody under the age of 25 went mad for it, but couldn't afford one because it's too grand. Within three months, Chinese manufacturers have ramped up, British entrepreneurs have got on board, and it's 250 quid. And three months after that, the market collapses when the British government says, A, you can't ride it anywhere, and B, two of them blew up and burned someone's house down. You know, that, that incredible high frequency change, which created a load of businesses, created the businesses, you know, selling these things, servicing these things, customising these things, and then destroyed a load of businesses when it collapsed so quickly, um, including a lot of the manufacturers in China, you know, small family owned uh, factories in China couldn't get out of the hoverboard business fast enough when the market collapsed that a load of the businesses there collapsed. And, you know, it's, it's incredible high frequency change where product appears, m hits the peak of its life cycle and then disappears again within the space of six months. And the book is an attempt to explain that. It explains why we feel like change happens fast now and 70% of adults do. Why so many businesses, and particularly business leaders, are scared and calling futurists for help, and really, and actually starts to explain what you do about it. Well, presumably, you get calls from companies that want to maintain their position and keep making money. Yeah, and and, and actually, I, I'm I'm a big fan of of big corporates. They get a lot of abuse, and we have this idea of these sort of you know Doctor Evil characters sitting in you know swanky boardrooms. And don't get me wrong, the boardrooms are swanky, mm. but I've never met a Doctor Evil yet. No. I've met lots of people who are you know human beings with families trying to balance, and they're well paid. Don't get me wrong, but they're trying to balance the demands of their kids saying, you know, mum, you know, climate change is coming, you've got to do something about it, you can't be this evil company. Mm. And shareholders saying, you know, we're a pension fund, you know, we need that 6% return over the next 12 months, otherwise, you know, our, our pensioners aren't going to have, a, 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 you know, any money. And it's, you know, it's obviously more complicated than that. But they're trying to, you know, do this balance between the short term and the long term. And a lot of my work is saying, <coughs> 
you've got to lift your eyes to the far horizon, not the near. Yeah. If you want to build a sustainable business and be remembered for sustainable success, you've got to stop thinking about the next 12 months, the next two years, and start thinking about the next five, the next 10, and build your business, build your strategy based on what's going to leave you a ethical brand with a solid supply chain and a, cons and a customer base that doesn't hate you in 10 years' time. Would, there, would you think any of that that advice would be relevant to an undergraduate? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think we hear a lot about purpose now. And I'm quite a skeptic that human beings have changed so radically in the last sort of 20 years that we've gone from wanting you know, 2.4 kids, a house and a shiny car to being all about purpose. But I think there has been something of a shift. And I think what it really is, is there's a, a generation now who are very cognizant of the negative impacts of what previous generations have chased. Mm. And so they're going into the workplace saying, sure, don't get me wrong, I want to be well paid. I want a good lifestyle. I want to have holidays. You know, I want to be able to do this stuff. But I want to be able to do that stuff for the next 50, 60 years. I'm probably going to be in work. And if, I, if I'm making terrible choices now about how my company behaves and where, who I work for, then I know that you know, 20 years time, you know, I'm going to be in the same trouble that my, you know, my, I'm going to be creating more trouble for my kids the same way it looks like my parents have created for me. And so I think you know, if you're going into the workplace now, people are expecting you to have a level of consciousness about that. Mm. There is an expectation that you will be um, you know, aware of some of the issues, that you will be making conscious choices about who you work for, how you work, and actually driving changes in working patterns around that as well, and behaviours. Yeah. And yeah, I think there's a, there's a, there's a call to, to undergraduates entering the workplace. You still have to have that discipline and that work ethic that people expect when you come into the workplace. But actually don't be afraid to be conscious and, and have an opinion and have a take on issues. Okay, talking of undergraduates, does anyone here have any questions for Tom, just stick your hand up. Maurice, if you could uh, keep it brief. You know, the, the way that social media is, people tend, to, I think, to be trapped in a bubble. They, they get things reflected back on them that they know. Music, they, 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 they play the music they know. Uh, politically, they, 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 they surround themselves. How can we pierce those bubbles and, and get our things that we do to the, those people? So Maurice is like worried that yeah. you're, you're in a bubble on social media and he wants to know how to pierce them so you get a wider view of everything. So, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very valid concern and I think, you know, I'm certainly, I'm concerned it's actually going to get worse before it gets better. You know, so I mentioned sort of mixed reality, this shift from us experiencing everything through a screen to experiencing everything through a pair of glasses. Imagine what happens when your bubble defines everything you see. Mm. Um, the flip side of that is actually the latest academic research suggests that the algorithms on the social networks actually show us more stuff that we disagree with than we agree with. Um, and actually they challenge people's point of view. Unfortunately, the effect that has because of the nature of us as humans is we see the stuff we disagree with and it reinforces our view rather than challenges it. And so in many ways, I think there is, there is an algorithmic problem, there is a social media bubble problem, but it actually really, I think there's a human problem because what, what, this incredible, what these incredible social networks have enabled is us to just redefine the boundaries of our own tribes where they used to be defined by geography and the people we lived with and we grew up with and we went to school with. Increasingly, they're defined by the views we hold, the, the music we like, the games we enjoy. And, it's, and so we, we, and our views of anything outside of those groups are not challenged by things we see that disagree with them, but reinforced by things we disagree with them. So my answer really is it comes back to education. How do we teach people to be open-minded? How do we teach them to be sceptical? How do we teach them to value evidence-based decision-making? And Im you know, embed that from the earliest days of education. And, and sadly, I think it's a really long-term project. Any more questions? To, yep, Jack? Do you think change is always a good thing, or do you think it depends on sort of circumstances? Uh, so, so Jack, what's it all, does he, do you think change is a good thing, or does it depend on the circumstances? It totally depends on the circumstances. Um, yeah, I think, I think people do get instinctively more small c conservative as they get older. But in many ways, that's quite a good check and balance against sort of radical change. Um, people, you know, most, and people tend to be scared of change as they get older as well, particularly in the workplace. But generally, I think human beings like to learn. We like new stuff. It's why every time there's a new iPhone out, it still gets, you know, 93 million pages <laughs> yes. of press coverage. Because we like new stuff. Um, you know, it's why you know, the, one of the most popular playlists on Spotify is, you know, is Release Radar. You know, it's, it's, we like to hear new stuff and what's going on. Um, so you know, by and large, I, I don't think all change is good. 
I think there's been certainly politically a lot of change in the last few years, you could probably argue is pretty bad. But I also think we have to have a very different attitude to change now. I think we have to be much more open to it. We have to be prepared to deal with it because we are going to have to deal with it. You know, we can't expect, I mean, no one can expect to go into a job now and expect to be in that job for 40 years. That just doesn't happen. Um, you know, no one can expect their industry even to look like it does in 40 years. You know, it's going to be fundamentally different. Uh, and so you know, we've, we've got to change our attitudes change. We've got to learn to be neophiles and we've got to learn to be excited by, enthused by change and actually learn the skills to deal with it, which is really about the skills of learning. You know, I think one of, the, one of the biggest pieces of advice I give to particularly senior leaders who've got a long experience in their industry is go and get a new hobby. Go and learn to do something you've never done before and get thrashed at it by eight-year-olds for like three <laughs> weeks while you learn. Because it humbles you, reminds you you don't know everything, and, but it really kick-starts those learning muscles again and forces you to start learning. I, I did it with roller skating about three years ago. I'm a very... Um, You're quite apt at that, though, aren't you? I am now. Yeah, you um, are. For the first you know, year, it was me being constantly humiliated by kids. Tom uh, posts pictures online about <laughs> his new roller boots or I have proper 70s clean, disco yeah. style boots yeah impressive <laughs> um, impressive any more questions from from the audience yeah there's a question there I have got a question um, when you come up with some uh, innovative ideas have you ever had the situation even though you've done enough research in the market you found out after doing some work before launching the project that somebody's already did it Right, so the question is, when you do your research and come up with an innovative idea, before you pass that on to the client, you find out someone else has done it? Has that ever happened? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I mean, it, it, but in many ways, that's a validation. Uh, you, when, you, when you do a startup, and when, like, I spend quite a lot of time in, in sort of startup land, uh, and you, you know, you've got this idea and you're pitching it to venture capitalists and investors, and the worst thing you can do is go and pitch them something completely new. Because A, they've got nothing to compare it against, and B, there's no validation that there's actually a market there. Whereas actually if there's two or three companies just starting to do the same thing, and the, the VCs go, well, okay, we're clearly not the only people investing in this. These people are trying to do it, these people are trying to do it. And now it's just a question of who executes best, who actually pursues the idea best. Yeah. So if, I, if that happened, I mean, it hasn't happened particularly with a client, but you know, if, a client, if I was looking at something and said, right, there's a real opportunity here, oh, and somebody's already doing it, it wouldn't stop me predict <coughs> pitching it to the client, it would actually reinforce them for me. I'd go to the client and go, look, somebody's already doing this, but I think we can do it better, you can execute better, or at least there's an opportunity there. Good question. Um, any more questions from anyone? No? Okay, well, just a reminder, everyone, that uh, High Frequency Change by Futurist Tom Cheese, right, is available right now in all good bookshops, and some rubbish ones as and well. And some rubbish ones as well. And there'll be a new one out in June. Because is that presumably that's out of date already, isn't it? Well, no. <laughs> the, the, the theories are there, no, um, but, theories th are. but that that one's the. I mean, that's the why you need to think about the future more. But the next one that comes out in June, called Future Proof Your Business, is how it's, it's all the tools that I use in my work, but distilled down into a book. Brilliant. Well, listen, Tom, thank you very much for uh, joining us on this Glendour University Creative Future session, ladies and gentlemen. Tom Cheese, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.